Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Boak, I'm Deputy Director here at the KITP. And it's our, our great pleasure to have Nicole Younger helping speaking tonight. This is the third in a series of book talks that we have run. The last one was Carlo Rovelli, if uh, you remember, if any of you were present at that, uh, talking on black holes. Um, we will have about 35 minute or so presentation from Nicole, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So that'll be pretty informal. You feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question as if in person, or if you put, want to put something in the chat, then um, we'll be looking at the chat. Christy's going to be looking at the chat, and we can uh, pass your question on to uh, Nicole. And remember uh, to mute yourself during the presentation. So um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Nicole here to speak to us tonight. Nicole is a theoretical physicist at uh, what we call NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and a fellow at this great Maryland Center, Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science. Uh, her PhD is down the road at Caltech, uh, where she won the Ilya Prigogine Prize for her thesis, quite an achievement. And in her postdoctoral period uh, at uh, Harvard, she won uh, a International Quantum Technology Emerging Researcher Award. So you can read all about that great stuff in the bio that came with your invitation. Uh, I think the uh, most important, two very important things. Nicole was a graduate fellow at KRTP, so we're, and she's been a frequent visitor to programs here in the past and will be in the future. And her, her title and her blogging and so on made such an impact. I even have a friend from Pickleball asking me for, <laughs> for the registration link for this uh, talk. So, uh, Nicole, thank you very much, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Mark, for the wonderful introduction, and thanks very much to the KITP for the opportunity to give this talk. So, as Mark said, I was a graduate fellow during the course of my PhD, and ever since I've come back to the KITP, it has really felt like home. So, I'm absolutely delighted to share with this community. I spent a year studying physics here in a city called Waterloo in Canada near Toronto. This was right before my PhD. I found out that Waterloo excels in theoretical physics, tech startups, and winter. Lots and lots of winter. But eventually the winter ends, and one day in the spring for a study break, I visited the Waterloo Public Library. There, I found this novel by the Canadian poet Jay Ruzaski, The Walsenburg Clock. The one scene takes place in Austria during the 1800s. An inventor is standing on a balcony, gazing down at the ballroom below, which he's converted into a workshop. He and his family members build automata, a clockwork-driven elephants and snakes and so on. So, this inventor is gazing down on his miraculous creations with his overcoat trailing out behind him. And I'm just thinking, what atmosphere? What a scene. It was shortly after that that I learned that I had encountered steampunk. Steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film. Steampunk stories take place during the Victorian era when the Industrial Revolution has been humming, some of the earliest factories are belching smoke into the air, London is full of smog and Sherlock Holmesian mysteries, railroads are cutting across the American West for the first time, and people wear waistcoats or petticoats. Against this backdrop are futuristic technologies, automata, time machines, flying ships, and submarines. Another Canadian poet, 
Douglas Featherling has supposedly said, steampunk is a genre that imagines how different the past might have been had the future come earlier. You might have encountered this steampunk novel, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. It's one of the first steampunk works as it was written during the 1800s. But steampunk is very much with us still. The invention of Hugo Cabret was a New York Times bestseller in the early 2000s. Enola Holmes was one of the first films released on Netflix due to the pandemic. It's about Sherlock Holmes' little sister who's called Enola. The film was a hit and I loved it too. Fortunately, the sequel is coming out soon. The Nevers is a show on HBO about Victorian women who have supernatural gifts. These works reach back to the past and ahead to the future. This fusion of old and new creates wonderful sense of nostalgia and adventure, romance and exploration. The fans dress up in steampunk costumes, with top hats and goggles and gears, gather at steampunk conventions for the sake of fantasy. But this supposed fantasy of steampunk is becoming a reality in my area of research. I'm a theoretical physicist. Like my colleagues at the KITP, I model the universe with mathematics. And then I find features of the world that weren't known before that surprise us. These features often crop up in extreme settings that we don't encounter in our everyday lives. For instance, at very low temperatures or in systems of just a few atoms. Specifically, I work at the intersection of three fields, quantum physics, information science, and energy science. I'll briefly preview this intersection, then explain it in more detail. Information science is the study of how efficiently we can process information, solve computational problems, encrypt information, and more. Quantum physics is the study of the very small, such as single atoms and ions. They can behave in counterintuitive ways impossible for everyday objects. Scientists and engineers are now leveraging these counterintuitive behaviors to build quantum computers, which will process information in ways that familiar technologies, such as our laptops, cannot. Thermodynamics is the study of energy. It was developed during the Victorian era to describe the work performed by a cutting edge technology of the day, the steam engine. Today's cutting edge technologies include quantum devices, which are very, very different. So we need to re-envision the thermodynamics of the 1800s for the 21st century. We need to ask how quantum engines would look and what they could achieve. We need to reach back to the past and ahead to the future. And the resulting fusion of old and new I call quantum steampunk. So a genre of science fiction is coming to life at this intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. So let's look at each of these components more closely. Information science is the study of how efficiently we can perform information processing tasks. These include solving computational problems, such as calculating a satellite's trajectory, communicating information, such as over the web, securing information cryptographically, and storing information in memories. We live in the information age, but what is information? It's basically the ability to distinguish between alternatives. Say that a friend asks you if the pub down the street in Victorian London, of course, is open or closed. You peer through the window and see either foaming mugs or cleaned mugs sitting upside down on the counter. You've gained the ability to distinguish whether the pub is open or closed. You've gained information. 
we measure quantities in units, such as seconds or teaspoons. What is the basic unit of information? It's called the bit. It's the amount of information we gain if we have no idea of the answer to a yes or no question, and we learn the answer. Say that when your friend asks about the pub, the pub has a probability one half of being open and a probability one half of being closed. When you peer through the window, you gain a bit of information. We encode a bit in a physical system that can be in one of two possible states, such as a thumb that's pointing upward or downward. In a familiar computer, a bit is encoded in a transistor that has the value one or the value zero. Quantum physics is the study of very small things, such as single electrons or atoms or particles of light, which are called photons. These systems behave in ways impossible for everyday objects, such as books and microphones and human beings. Everyday objects are large, are massive, and contain many, many particles. We call them classical. So quantum physics is non-classical. What are these counterintuitive quantum behaviors? We can begin to grasp one by imagining that some young physicist, let's call her Audrey, has an electron and her brother Baxter has another electron. The siblings can perform some operation on their particles that creates entanglement between them. Entanglement is a relationship that quantum particles can share and classical particles cannot. Entanglement creates strong correlations between outcomes of measurements. Here's a glimpse of how it works. Suppose that Audrey measures some property of her particle and the measurement has two possible outcomes, which we'll label one and zero. For instance, Audrey can measure whether her particle has a lot of energy or a little energy. If the two particles are entangled as strongly as possible, she'll have no idea which outcome she'll obtain. The one and zero have 50-50 chances. Now, suppose that instead, Audrey measures her particle and Baxter measures his. The two siblings can predict something about the joint outcome. In one example, if Audrey obtains a one, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a zero. And if Audrey obtains a zero, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a one. Furthermore, there is a measurement that the siblings can perform jointly on the pair of particles together, such that the siblings can predict the outcome with certainty in advance. So there's something, some information that isn't in Audrey's particle, it isn't in Baxter's particle, and it isn't in the sum of the two particles addressed independently. It's spread across the pair. When it comes to entanglement, the whole really is greater than the sum of its parts. Scientists and engineers are now leveraging entanglement in quantum information science. Quantum information science is the study of how we can use quantum phenomena to process information in ways forbidden for classical systems. Quantum information technologies include you know, quantum computers, networks for communication, cryptographic systems, and more. Quantum computers will be able to solve in minutes certain problems that would cost even supercomputers many years. Today's quantum computers are small and limited. Many of us in the field expect that we'll take a good number more of years to build quantum computers up to their full potential. Applications will include information security. 
you've purchased merchandise online, say through Amazon, your credit card information has been secured with a common cryptographic protocol. Classical computers can't break that safeguard in any reasonable amount of time to the best of our computer science knowledge. Quantum computers will be able to break the safeguard easily. On the other hand, quantum phenomena provide new resources for protecting information. In 2017, researchers in China and Austria conducted the first video teleconference encrypted with quantum resources. An important application of quantum computers will be research and development in material science and chemistry. That might sound mundane, but in some countries, food security is at crisis levels. In other countries, food security is at the highest levels ever in history. So fertilizer is extremely important across the globe. We invest about 3% of the world's entire energy output in fertilizer production. Why do we spend so much energy? Because we produce fertilizer using an old technique from 1909. Bacteria can accomplish the same goal much more efficiently. But those bacteria use a molecule that's too complicated for us to simulate on classical computers. That molecule, though, is quantum. So a quantum computer will naturally be better suited to unlocking the molecule's secrets. And if all goes as hoped, and that's a very big if, transforming fertilizer production and energy use. Little wonder that governments across the world are pouring funds into quantum research, technology, and education. In 2018, Congress passed the National Quantum Initiative Act, which provided $1.2 billion for quantum efforts. Even more astoundingly, the Senate passed the act unanimously. Everyone in the Senate actually agreed on it. Not only governments, but also loads of companies are investing in quantum science and technology. Here is an advertisement from Microsoft about its quantum products. Google, IBM, Amazon, and Honeywell have quantum teams. Quantum startups are booming. At least two have become publicly traded in the past few years. An example is Rigetti, whose team is shown here back in March when the company debuted on the stock market. This object belongs to IBM. This is not a quantum computer, even though it looks cool enough to be one, doesn't it? Actually, many people think it looks steampunk because of the gold and copper and wires sticking out. This object holds a quantum computer, which fits on a small chip. The chip needs to be at low temperatures to support quantum behavior, such as entanglement. So this device cools the quantum computer to temperatures lower than that of outer space. This device is called a dilution refrigerator, or to those of us in the fields, a fridge. Actually, when my husband heard that, he's a classical computer scientist, he was indignant. He said, this cools things down to below the temperature of outer space, and you can't even call it a freezer. Anyway, cooling leads us to the third element in our triumvirates, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, the forms that energy can be in and the transformations amongst those forms. Objects can transmit energy in two forms, heat and work. Heat is the uncoordinated energy of particles jiggling about randomly. Heat is disorganized energy, so it's not directly useful. Work is coordinated energy that can be directly harnessed to power a factory or charge a battery or raise an anchor. Heat engines convert random heats into coordinated work. 
heat engines drove the Industrial Revolution by powering the first factories. Around that era, people started wanting to know how efficiently engines could operate. So they developed the theory of thermodynamics, giving it a practical bent. However, the practical questions led to fundamental questions, such as why does time flow in only one direction? And do materials really consist of particles too small for us to see? Atomism, the theory of atoms, hadn't been entirely accepted by the Victorian era. Cooling, expelling heat, is a thermodynamic process. But how do you measure the heat emitted by a quantum system that's cooling? You can measure the heat emitted by a classical system by measuring the system's energy, cooling the system, and measuring the energy again. The initial energy minus the final energy is the heat lost. But quantum systems are more delicate than classical systems. You might have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Werner Heisenberg was a German physicist who helped found quantum theory during the 1920s. He intuited that if you measure a quantum system, you disturb it. If you measure a quantum system's energy, you can change the energy. So how we can measure quantum heat or even conceive of quantum heat is not straightforward. Furthermore, this fridge is a large classical system. What if we tried to build a fridge from a quantum system? Could we? How small could we make it? Could quantum phenomena such as entanglement benefit a quantum fridge as they benefit quantum computers? More generally, just as there are information processing tasks, such as encrypting information, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as refrigerating and powering cars and charging batteries. Given that quantum phenomena benefit information processing tasks, can they benefit thermodynamic tasks? How can we extend the Victorian theory of thermodynamics from large classical systems, such as steam engines, to small quantum and information processing systems? These questions underpin quantum thermodynamics, my field of research. This field shares its aesthetic, its spirit, with steampunk which is why I call this work quantum steampunk. Quantum thermodynamics has roots that stretch back to the 1930s. Right after quantum theory was formulated, people began wondering whether it could explain thermodynamic phenomena. During the 1950s and 60s, researchers designed the first quantum engine. It consists of one atom that you can use in a maser. A maser is like a laser that you can point at the floor and jiggle around to drive your cat insane. But whereas a laser emits visible lights, a maser emits microwave radiation. It turns out an engine doesn't need gears and cogs and other moving pieces. It needs only one atom. Over the ensuing decades, quantum thermodynamics had a small following. It wasn't seen as a discipline. Some people even said that quantum thermodynamics is an oxymoron. Thermodynamics was invented to describe large classical systems such as steam engines. So thermodynamics couldn't possibly have anything to say about quantum systems. However, over the past decade, quantum thermodynamics has experienced a boom. Here's a photo from my community's big annual conference in 2018. You might recognize the background as we met at the KITP. In fact, this KITP conference was, to my knowledge, the second quantum thermodynamics conference ever to take place on US soil. We quantum thermodynamicists form an international community that has hotspots in 
the United Kingdom, Germany, Israel, Brazil, Switzerland, and elsewhere. A few of us quantum thermodynamicists work in the United States. The US broadly is starting to catch on. Why has quantum thermodynamics been booming? Quantum information science matured in the early 2000s. It came to offer a mathematical and conceptual toolkit for understanding quantum systems through how they store and manipulate information. Quantum information science also came to offer unprecedented experimental opportunities. Labs achieved exquisite control over tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms and ions. We've been using all these tools of quantum information science to build and test a theory of quantum thermodynamics. Here's an example. We'll start with a classical story that shows the interplay between information and energy. Then we'll see what quantum physics adds. We can store a bit of information, not just in a transistor, but also in a gas particle in a box. Suppose that this particle is classical, like a miniature basketball. It's a really, really simple gas. If the gas is on the box's right-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a one. If the gas is on the left-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a zero. By the way, this illustration is by Todd Cahill. So Todd is a steampunk artist. He illustrated my book. He had no experience with quantum physics whatsoever, but he managed to make gorgeous illustrations, including this one and ones that I'll be showing. Suppose that we have no idea where the particle is. It can be anywhere in the box. Its position is totally random. Suppose that we want to reset the particle's position to the box's right-hand side, a nice, clean, known state. This is like taking a messy sheet of scrap paper that's been scribbled on totally randomly and erasing it to a nice, clean state. To erase the bits encoded by the gas, we let the gas exchange heat with its surroundings, which have a fixed temperature, through the box's walls. We slide a partition into the box near the left-hand wall, and then we push the partition to the box's center. The gas ends up trapped in the right-hand side. At what cost? We compress the gas, so we have to exert energy namely work, the coordinated, useful type of energy that can be transferred between systems. So we spend work to reset the particle's position, to erase the bit of information. In other words, erasure, an information processing task, costs work, a thermodynamic resource. What's more, suppose that we want to compute and compute and compute and compute. Eventually, we'll run out of scrap paper. The universe doesn't contain an infinite supply of scrap paper, so we'll have to erase some. We just saw that erasure costs thermodynamic work. So computation has an intrinsic thermodynamic cost. When I first learned that in my first quantum computing class, senior spring of college, it blew my mind because a priori, information and energy seem to have nothing to do with each other, but they turn out to be inextricably bound up. Ralph Landauer, an information scientist at IBM, realized this in 1961. The process that we just saw is therefore called Landauer erasure. What if we add quantum physics to this 
mix of information and energy. The story can change in many different ways. I'll share one way discovered by friends of mine, including the Portuguese physicist Lydia Del Rio. Suppose that we want to erase not a classical bit of information, but a quantum bit, a qubit, a basic unit of quantum information. We can encode a qubit in an electron, such as Audrey's electron from a few minutes ago. Audrey's qubit can be entangled with Baxter's qubit in some fixed temperature environment. Remember, if Audrey's qubit is entangled with Baxter's as strongly as possible, and Audrey measures her qubit, she has no idea whether she'll obtain a one or a zero. The outcome is totally random. So Audrey's qubit resembles the gas particle bit whose location, right or left, one or zero, is totally random. Just as we could erase the gas particle bits, Audrey can erase her qubit. My colleagues proved that Audrey can erase her qubit while gaining work that she can use to charge a battery or lift a tiny weight. This result should surprise us. Landauer showed that we have to spend work to erase information. The trick is to sort of burn the correlations between the qubits. Entanglement serves as a kind of thermodynamic fuel together with heat. So quantum phenomena such as entanglement can serve as resources in thermodynamics in gaining work as well as in information processing. Beyond erasing information, we can build quantum thermodynamic engines, refrigerators, ratchets, and batteries. Quantum phenomena can benefit these devices, my community has found. We can use entanglement as a resource in refrigeration. We can charge quantum batteries at a greater power if we entangle them than if we don't. A quantum engine that burns information can perform more work on average than its classical counterpart. And quantum engines can operate under conditions in which classical engines cannot. These results not only help us extend Victorian thermodynamics into the 21st century, but also shed new light on what distinguishes the quantum world from the classical. If we gaze into the future of quantum steampunk, what do we see? First, this field has been gaining momentum and participation sight unseen over the past decade. I expect the field to continue this upswing and increasingly join the ranks of established fields of physics, such as astrophysics and elementary particle physics, and as of a few years ago, even quantum information science. Some of us quantum thermodynamicists are building bridges to long established disciplines, just as quantum information science has offered a new lens onto other fields, such as thermodynamics, we're now using quantum thermodynamics to understand black holes and chemistry and more and you. Second, quantum thermodynamics has its roots in theory. From quantum thermodynamics, we've gained fundamental insights into what distinguishes quantum from classical physics, what it means for time to flow, and more. But quantum thermodynamics is growing increasingly experimental. Experiments are testing the theory and sparking new theory. Personally, as a theorist, I'm collaborating with four labs now. One uses photons, one uses ions, and two use artificial atoms. We have many options, and I expect us to take advantage of them increasingly. Most of the experiments happening now are proof of principle. They show that we can operate quantum engines 
if we try very hard. But those engines aren't practical. They perform less work then we have to invest in cooling the engines down and manipulating them. So a third opportunity is to make quantum thermodynamics practical. The original theory of thermodynamics went hand in hand with the industrial revolution, which was eminently practical. Quantum thermodynamics should go hand in hand with similar utility. For my part, I'm working with experimentalists in Sweden on a quantum refrigerator for cooling quantum computers. Suppose that the quantum computer inside this classical refrigerator has just completed a computation. Its qubits are used up. To reset the qubits, we have to cool them even more. We can put a quantum refrigerator inside the classical refrigerator to reset the qubits. The experimental test of our theory is actually taking place now at Chalmers University in Sweden. And as practicality develops, so will our theoretical understanding. Quantum thermodynamics is an incredibly exciting emerging field. It is vibrant and growing. It offers both fundamental insights and technological possibilities. When I was a master's student back in Waterloo, I read about steampunk in a novel. But this genre of fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. The fantasy of steampunk is becoming a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for a wonderfully clear talk. Uh, I see, well, there's a uh, clapping and thanks uh, going on in the background. Uh, we can open things up now for questions. We need a volunteer to get things going and then things usually roll after that. You've stunned them all into silence. It was such a beautiful presentation, Cole. <laughs> I was I was quite uh, quite intrigued with all your comments. So um, Mary Rayburn has a question who says she's seventy, but I live to see any of this in utility. <laughs> Anything that's going to be in in the practical world in the next little bit in your mind, Nicole. Well, the experimentalists in Sweden are supposed to be doing our experiments right about now or maybe next week, and. According to the simulations of the experiments, which will probably be wrong somehow, but they are some prediction, the um, quantum refrigerator can compete with some of our best techniques for cooling these parts of quantum computers, at least according to certain metrics, such as how cold the qubits end up getting. So at least that's an application that we hope will be used in let's say, ideally, in the next couple of years. Okay, great. Well, that's very helpful to know. I see lots of friends on the call. It's so great to see those of you who are on monitor. Great to see you, Paul. Great to see you, Chelsea, coming in from Pacific Northwest. Colin, you said in your earlier simple gas box with one atom of gas, why were you not going from a state of not knowing where the atom resided to a state of knowing it? was on the right-hand side when you use work to push it over, where you're not gaining info instead of erasing. Yes. When in the gas in the box story, we start with the gas in an unknown position and we end with the gas in a known position. So what, you, what we should have in mind is how this is, suppose that the gas is just somewhere in the box. Uh, we don't know where it is. This is the state that you would find, uh, let's say, a, a transistor or anything that encodes a bit of information in if someone has just completed a computation. Or to go back to the scrap paper analogy, suppose that we're in math class and we've just completed a computation. We've scribbled all over a piece of paper. 
and then you hand the piece of paper over to the next person who comes into math class. To that person, it's just a bunch of random, random scribbling, so they don't know uh, they don't they don't know the information that's there if they don't take a close look. Um, just as if the particle is anywhere in the box, we don't know where it is. We haven't been looking very closely to see exactly where the particle is. So this particle um, is like the result, or this particle in a box is like the result of some computation that someone did before. Um, it, to us, it's just a mess. To be able to use the gas in a box again, we have to know where the particle is so that uh, we can then um, force the particle to be in one location or another, depending on whether we want to encode a one or a zero in it. And then we could maybe take multiple gases and boxes and put them together and have them interact to perform a computation. And that is like having this messy sheet of scrap paper that's been handed up to us by someone who just finished math class and erasing that sheet of paper so that we can encode new information in it. Okay. Howard, does that answer your question? Let's see. Okay, we have another question um, from my friend. Will a new genre of entertainment mirror quantum steampunk? What will be your ultimate steampunk show? I very much hope so. In fact, I'm hoping during the next couple of years to start with a quantum steampunk short story contest. Because steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film, and it would be wonderful to make quantum steampunk into a subgenre. Also, the KITP is in Southern California, so if anyone is around from Hollywood, then I'd be interested in talking. Christy, do you want to read the next question? Sure. You have a question from Richard Stoll. Uh, question is, do you ever take inspiration for theories from video games, especially ones that try out applications with quantum theories in mind, like, for example, Bioshock Infinite? And then a great presentation, exclamation point. Thank you. I haven't personally taken inspiration from video games. Now, there are a lot of quantum scientists who create games to try to, in, in the interest of quantum education, to get people from all ages interacting with the rules of quantum theory and starting to get a feel for them. So people have devised, for instance, quantum chess. And I, I think that a former classmate of mine is the world champion in quantum chess. There's a whole slew of quantum games now. Although I have heard that Someone mentioned in the past that Bioshock was inspired by quantum theory. So there are lots of books that are inspired by quantum theory or quantum computers. I know Neil Stevenson, not too long ago, published a book that, in, let's say, involved a, an imaginative application of quantum computers. A number of books featured the idea that there could be many worlds. So there's, I think, a very rich interplay between physics and the arts and literature. Um, I have a question, Nicole. So uh, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, it's full of uh, equalities and inequalities, which are very powerful. Even the non-equilibrium case, uh, there are results. So can you give us an idea of progress in the, the quantum generalization of those kinds of results? Yes, there are, perhaps we should start with the laws of thermodynamics. There are four laws of thermodynamics. And what I think of as maybe the most important is the second law of thermodynamics. It helps us understand why time flows in just one direction. One can phrase the second law of thermodynamics in multiple ways. One way is an inequality. Suppose that we have a closed, isolated system like a gas in a box or our universe. The entropy, very loosely speaking, the disorder in the system or uncertainty about the system, its configuration, grows or remains constant. 
over time. So the entropy at an earlier time and uh, is always less than or equal to the entropy at a later time. So disorder grows, basically. In quantum thermodynamics and closely related fields such as statistical mechanics, people have managed to strengthen the second law in a number of ways. For instance, we could, th this statement of the second law really applies only to systems that are very, very, very large and contain say, many copies of basically one particle, but it holds with a good approximation for worlds like or systems like ones that we would find in our world that are finite size, but have lots and lots of particles, the sorts of systems that we would find in our everyday world, such as a steam that is growing to fill a kitchen. That's pretty well described by the second law of thermodynamics. Also, the second law of thermodynamics, strictly speaking, applies just to systems that are in equilibrium. So equilibrium is a very quiet state in which large scale properties like volume and energy and the number of particles remain constant. And there's no net flow of anything such as energy or particles into or out of the system. That's a, a quiet state. So the second law really says that if you have a really, 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 really big system and it's an initially in this really quiet state and you have in mind some possible final quiet state and you're wondering, can this state transform into that other state as time's flowing naturally? Then the answer is yes, just if the entropy, this measure of the disorder, increases or remains constant during the imagined process. But we can generalize this question. Suppose that the system is small, maybe it consists of just one particle, maybe it's quantum, maybe it's entangled. Maybe it has wave-like quantum properties. Since according to quantum theory, systems have both particle-like and wave-like properties. In these cases, if we want to ask, can this quantum state turn into another quantum state? We can't just check whether one inequality was satisfied. We have to check whether a whole set of inequalities is satisfied because we're asking a more general question, and we have to do more mathematical legwork to answer it. So in quantum thermodynamics and closely related fields, there have been a number of generalizations of results like the all important second law of thermodynamics. Thank you. More questions? Got a few more minutes. We're going to try and honor getting everybody off within the hour, um, especially our wonderful speaker who's on the East Coast. Um, and I know many of us have dinner plans and other things coming up, but if there are any final questions, we would love to um, have them now. You can chat or just unmute and speak up. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to say um, your book just arrived and ah, wonderful. I'm very much looking to getting it started. So thank you so much for this talk. I very much hope you enjoy it. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. I have one more, which is will quantum physics be involved with the metaverse? The metaverse. My understanding of the metaverse is basically the internet and things connected to it and a lot of movement of our lives into the online world. Although that isn't my area of expertise, so I could have gotten the definition wrong. Um, at the moment, quantum computers are not at the stage at which we would be using them in our everyday lives. We're basically at the stage which people were a few decades ago when they said, oh, we built these computers, but no one's going to want them in their homes. They're just for very specialized use. So as far as we know, quantum computers will be for specialized use, for instance, for companies that are trying to design certain chemicals or certain materials or maybe optimize 
the flow of traffic in some system. So there are certain problems that a quantum computer can solve well and certain problems that it doesn't help with. For instance, I wouldn't recommend doing your taxes on a quantum computer. So we might see the effects of a quantum computer in the results of problems that we might be able to solve better with a quantum computer, such as fertilizer production and energy use, maybe drug discovery, maybe optimization in traffic flow. We don't at the moment see uh, quantum computers being used in households, although again, it is quite possible that there's a lot of a lot ahead that we do not envision. I also mentioned Neil Stevenson, who's an author. He recently wrote a book in which I think people upload their brains to the quantum cloud with the help of quantum computers. So that is a, an imaginative fictional application of quantum computers. I, I don't expect that to happen, but I can't really say that it won't. Thank you. Christy, would you like to wrap up? I think so. This has been such a great talk and conversation. Thank you so much, Nicole, for this um, very illuminating conversation tonight. And thank, thank you, you for having me. It's been really, uh, really a pleasure. Yay. We're so appreciative. And thank you to all of our friends um, of KITP and community members, um, many of whom are, are tuning in from all parts of the nation. So um, thanks. Thanks so much for being here tonight. And um, with that, we wish you all a great evening. Thank you, Mark, for moderating. Thank you, Nicole. And thanks for all attending and for Christy to organize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Enjoy your evening.